to break the law. And when we had that memorandum, he is essentially telling the people of New York has actually directed the uh, employees of DHS. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to this year's CPAC. I'm Julio Rosas. I'm the field reporter at my Substack, mostlypeaceful.live. Be sure to check that out. Uh, I'm always glad to be coming uh, here to CPAC to talk about this important issue because, as we all know, the border uh, is a mess. I wonder why. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but to, to kick things off, uh, Chairman Green, uh, you made history recently with uh, the House impeaching the first city. Yes. I wanted to ask you, because that, that, that took a long time, because we talked about that this time last year, and you, you were setting the stage for that. Um, so now that you've gone through the process and uh, that's been completed, what, what surprised you the most in terms of the, what you were finding out and then kind of what happened after the fact? I think the thing that surprised me the most, and thanks for, thanks for mentioning it, was the smoking gun. When we found the memorandum, uh, where Secretary of New York has actually directed the uh, employees of DHS to break the law. And when we had that memorandum, he is essentially telling the people of DHS that the laws passed by the United States Congress don't matter, and he basically can pick and choose whichever laws he wants to enforce. Uh, that, that, that's pretty shocking. We'd have a cabinet secretary that could actually disregard the Constitution so much, the separation of powers, and tell the United States Congress we're not following the law. And, and, and that's important to highlight because, uh, unsurprisingly, the mainstream media doesn't view it that way. Uh, they, the New Yorker recently just did a profile on the secretary, and uh, the, the, the sub-headline really encapsulates what, what kind of what the, the chairman and his committee was facing going through this process. It says, the Secretary of Homeland Security has been forced to respond to an unprecedented flow of migrants to the U.S.-Mexico border. Why are Republicans in Congress impeaching him for it? Uh, and I kind of liken it to, it was like, well, we have an arsonist that uh, has to contend with all the fires that he started. Why are the police after him? Uh, so, so, Tom, you and President Trump have promised that should he get back into the White House after this year, that there's going to be the biggest deportation operation in U.S. history. What exactly goes into that? Like, are you able to offer kind of any specifics on what, on how you're going to be able to contend with that, but also the expected backlash from the, from the left? Well, a couple of things. First of all, you're exactly right. So for the millions of illegal aliens that have been released in this country, don't get too comfortable because we're coming looking for it. Uh, as far as a... As far as the backlash, look, I'm used to it. As the ice director, I have protesters in my house. I've, I've been called a racist, a white nasty you name I've been calling. I, I, I frankly don't give a shit what people think about me. Because, uh, you, know, you know, I promised my wife I should stop swearing, so I apologize for that. If I offend anybody, I don't care. But the bottom line is, they've released, out, they've, they've, they've released literally millions, uh, 3.3 .3 million, they knowingly released, and that's not even counting the almost 2 million gotaways. People demand they get due process. People demand they get the right to, to, to claim asylum. But you know what? If we're going to spend billions of dollars on this whole process at the end. You look at immigration court data, nine out of 10 of these people claim asylum at the border will get an order removal because they simply don't qualify for asylum. So there has to be an historic deportation operation at the end of historic illegal immigration. It has to be that way. There's no other option. And for the, you know, I, I was asked on the Hill the other day about that. You said you're going to do this. and. Uh, run, uh, run the biggest deportation operation, can you justify what you said? I said, there's no justification. I said it. I'll do it. Because that's what's required by law to do. So, yeah, I, it's the right thing to do. It, 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 you can't, if, if you don't do it, then you're never going to solve the border crisis. If there isn't consequences for entering the country illegally, which is a crime, remember, I had to, I, I, I had to remind AOC of that. If, if, if you're going to enter this country and it's a crime and you get your due process in front of a judge, and he orders you removed, you have to remove him. There's no other option. The only other option is to let him stay. If you do that, you're never going to fix the border. I am. I am. Right. And, and, and so, Sarah, I mean, you, I mean, you and I have spent a lot of time uh, down, down there at the border and, and seeing it firsthand. I mean, I mean how, how, can, how can we do a better job of kind of conveying to the American people? Because there is a little bit of numbness to it just because the problem has been persistent for so long. What do you think that... The, for the media that's actually doing the work to show what's going on at, at the southern border, I mean, what, 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 what is there to actually do to kind of go 
get further reach with how big of this problem is? I think it's a great question, Julio, and I want to just come right off of what Tom was saying. The most humane, the most humane way to handle the border for both the illegal uh, aliens, illegal migrants that are heading this way, and for our nation is to enforce the law. Period. When I'm covering the border, I think people do become numb to it. Uh, a lot of times what happens is we've seen the hundreds, the thousands pouring across. We've seen the people coming from all over the world, basically because Biden's policy was an open, and is an open border policy, right? So they don't plan on enforcing it, which is what the chairman said, you know, with the smoking gun memorandum from Mayorkas. Mayorkas basically detailed, I think it was seven pages, detailed exactly how they could skirt the law, right? And to enter like, oh wait, it doesn't matter if they have a criminal background, doesn't matter if they came in here three times with a, you know, convicted of DUIs. It, as long as they're good now, you can let them stay. I want you to think about that. How many people have come into this country and what Tom just said, you know, it's not just about the apprehensions which are gonna be over, I think, over 10 million by the end of his term and the known gotaways, but I was talking to people in the intelligence community uh, late last night even about the fact that we there are people we don't even know who they are. They came in um, in the back of a truck, in a crate. We don't even know them as a known gotaway. They're just a gotaway. And they could be planning on targeting our children, our communities right now, planning an attack in this country. There is no doubt in my mind that that will happen. So what I've tried to do to just kind of take away that numbness and wake up people, which I try to do on Fox News, which I try to do on my website, which Tom and I have done with our group, Border 911, and I think is very important, is to say this is not a border issue. This is in every single community across the country. It is the reason I go to Denver and talk to the people in Denver where they're facing 40,000 right now it, migrants. I, I guess they're not illegal if Biden let them in, but 40,000 migrants, people living on the streets, panhandling, living on the streets with their children, can't even get a job. So we're bringing people in that can't even work. And then we're handing them visas for what? $10,000 in New York City? You know, here's your card, which by the way is being hacked and taken by criminal networks. So people are on the streets and living on the streets and we've got criminals robbing and pillaging in our cities and we've got drugs. The cops getting beat up in Times Square. If right. I could, if, if I could jump in on that though, one of the things we also have to do is elect in our primaries candidates who actually make the border a priority. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example in Virginia 7, um, a young man, uh, ex Navy SEAL, Hamilton is running, and he made, he's in Virginia, and he made the border the number one issue. Right. And that's the kind of candidates we've got to be supporting, is people who say this is the greatest national security threat to our country, and we're going to make it number one even though we're not in Texas or Arizona. Yeah, whether I, it's I've, Denver or Chicago or any place else. I actually, I actually support. endorse Cameron, because Cameron does take the border seriously. He's great. So God bless Cameron and his fight to... to to fight this country, we can take this country back. Well, well, Mr. Chairman, because I mean, Sarah was talking about basically the, the threats that are step, the national security threats, and obviously you, you chaired the, the Homeland Security Committee. Um, you know, to, to what you're able to convey, I mean, from what you have seen from, from your briefings and from, from all the stuff that you're getting as a chairman, how concerned are you when it comes to the threats stemming from not only just the, the southern border, but the northern border as well? Because I mean, we had that case where an Al Shabaab terrorist was, pr I mean, he wasn't a guy, he yeah. was processed and he was in the country for a year. Uh, in Minneapolis, I wonder why he went there. Uh, to to before before they realized, oh wait, this is an actual terrorist. We need to go get him, and thankfully they did. But so, from from your from your you know position, how how concerned are you about? That? I think every American should be scared to death. Um, not only is it the terrorist threat, we've had like almost 400 uh, in this presidency, where there were 11 last time. Um, but it, it's. 24,000 Chinese nationals came in last year, 20,000 since October 1. The highest year before that was 1,800. You don't leave China with the social credit score system unless the CCP knows about it. They're flying to South America and, they're, and Central America and they're, they're coming up here, they're paying 60 grand to the cartels, which is enriching the cartels, a, a, a terrible organization. They're subhuman. 
uh, and, and were basically feeding them money, letting these individuals come into the United States. They read the Ukraine, the Russia's uh, modus operandi for Ukraine, and that is infiltrate the green men, they called them, guys in the little green uniforms, into Ukraine. They became the saboteurs. Now, I'm not suggesting that China is going to be attacking the United States, but if we defend Taiwan, I can't imagine there aren't people in there who are going to be tracking our, our railheads, looking at our ports, um, who knows what else. We've had mass waves of Chinese terrorists storming military installations with cameras. So, I, look, it's a, it's a desperate threat. And then the fentanyl, that little baby that was crawling around on a floor in a VRBO in Florida died because the previous tenant had left fentanyl. There isn't an American who is safe right now because of this open border and the failure of this secretary. And, and so, Tom, I mean, you, you, you've been in this field for a long time. You, you, you've been on the ground, and then you worked your way up. I mean... Uh, tell us about just the, the human impact about what's been happening could, from, from what you've seen even when it was happening on a very limited basis. Yeah, you know, I started in Border Patrol in 1984. And look, I worked for six presidents, starting with Ronald Reagan. And every president I ever worked for, even Clinton Obama, took some steps to secure the border because they understood you, you can't possibly have national security if you don't have border security. No one did more than President Trump. Well, president Trump did was unprecedented. And the reason I wake up pissed off every day is because... This administration, Joe Biden's the first president in the history of this nation who came in office and unsecured a border on purpose. And people want to say that the past administration, the Trump administration, you know, Trump, Holman, you're all, you know, again, racist, you, you know, your, 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 your policies are inhumane. Well, let me tell you something. President Trump had illegal immigration down to the 45-year low. Illegal immigration was down 83 to 90 percent. Dr. Rob Borders did a study. They, they, they estimated that 31% of women they talked to were sexually assaulted making that journey. That's who admitted 31%, 31%. So when President Trump had 90% less people coming, how many women weren't being raped? How many, how, many, how many aliens didn't die crossing the border? How many children didn't drown in the river? How many women and children weren't sex trafficked in the United States? How many pounds of fentanyl didn't make it into the United States because the border was secure? How many known suspected terrorists didn't cross the border because the border was secure? President Trump's policy saved lives. Under this administration, you want to say they're, they're the most humane. They say, well, the Biden administration, we're about humanity, we're more humane. Well, okay, let's look at the record. Since Biden been off, we've got over 1,700 dead migrants across the border. An historic record. 112,000 dead Americans from fentanyl poisonings. My first dead body that I saw in person yeah. was at the border from someone who drowned. Another historic record. 600% increase in sex trafficking of women and children. Another historic record. A record number of known suspected terrorists being arrested coming across the border. Another historic record. So Biden's policies are killing migrants at record numbers. It's killing Americans at record numbers. This administration, at all levels, is disgusting on what they did to our national security. I want people to know this isn't just about illegal immigration anymore. I don't care what your opinion is on illegal immigration. When you cause a crisis this big, on purpose... It's a it's dereliction a, of duty it's the of the president national security of the United threat States. This nation's ever had. And, 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 this is, and this is for kind of the, the, the media members that are in attendance or that are watching. So uh, it's been interesting seeing what's been happening over the, uh, the past month with, with the disastrous border bill that was being put together in the Senate. Because if you remember, the White House and the Democrats and the media are saying, well, well, Biden needs this bill that was basically an open borders bill. Let's, let's be real. Uh, because I need Congress to act. Well, what's, I don't know if anyone's paying attention, but now the Biden administration is considering, like, well, we might take some executive action to try to stem the flow of illegal immigration. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I think you had that power the whole time. I and mean, that's literally, like, that's what congressional Republicans have been asking for, just to you undo what you undid on day one. And Sarah, I mean, it hasn't it been funny seeing how the media has, like, kind of forgotten that though? Well, they've completely forgotten it. I don't think the American people have forgotten it. They see it every single day in their own communities. And Tom brought up a really good point that I think we, you know, this is about lives. Lives lost, right? American lives lost, migrant lives lost, a nation now facing one of the most historic national security crises. Tom, you've always said, and you know, Mark, we've talked about this, you know, the personal stories of loss, you know? And what are we willing to do to protect our children? Somebody out here said treason. You know, this is a dereliction of duty, it's treason. Call it what you want. 
but it is absolutely putting everybody's life at risk. And every time I go home and I see my children, and I think about the fentanyl on the streets, and I think about the kids who have died not even knowing that when they took a pill like a Percocet, that it was not Percocet, it was laced with fentanyl, and that their children never come home to the parents, right? This is something you saw with China as the chairman, you know, the movement of precursor chemicals into Mexico, that, what is happening to our country, and we're allowing it to happen. So this is my message, and I know we don't have a lot of time, and I'm gonna get right to what you were saying, Julio. We have to be the ones to stand up to this administration. We can't rely on the media to do it for us. We need to educate ourselves. We need to go to our schools. We need to go to the communities. And we need to say, no more. We will not allow you to do this to our country. Because if we don't, frankly, we will lose our nation. This is it, folks. It's 2024. And, and I think that that's very important because, I mean, just from my perspective and, and what kind of what we've seen over the past four years, I can't imagine how the state of the country is going to be if this is allowed to continue for another four years. After and you've seen it with me. Yeah. And, and so, and so uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I kind of wanted to ask, so now that you've got the impeachment done, um, and, and unfortunately, you'll, you'll be leaving uh, at, the, at the end of your term next year. So then what, what's kind of the next steps that at least that you can do in the meantime to try to keep pressing the issue? Well, we'll keep here doing our oversight hearings. We're going to keep subpoenaing. Uh, we're going to keep, I mean, he's obviously impeached now. So one of the things that we have to determine is uh, he's got to come present a budget. So we're looking at the rules on how do you, how do you bring an impeached secretary in so every time we can make an issue out of it and highlight the border, hopefully there's a trial in the Senate. And if there's a trial, there, look, Chuck Schumer does not want a trial in the Senate because we're talking about the border, and it, you know, when every time we talk about it, it, it hurts their candidate. And it's that's part of the reason why we did it in five phases was to educate the American people. To your last question, but um, yeah, I mean, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing, making America aware, and hopefully uh, we'll get good candidates in and. Uh, we beat this guy and put uh, Donald Trump in the White House. And, and, and Tom, I, I, I'm curious. I, I want to get your opinion because it, it seemed like it took a while for the rest of the country to really feel the impact of all this illegal migration coming in. Because, uh, because like with this past summer with like New York City and Chicago, they're finally starting to say like, "Hey, we're a sanctuary city." And it's like, "But wait, we don't want all these people coming in anymore." And you, some of these, and a lot of the residents. You know, they're not typical Republicans or Trump voters. They sound like they're coming straight from a MAGA rally. Do, do, do you think that there's going to be a tipping point? Or do you think we've reached that and enough people have kind of woken up to how serious the problem is? I think we're at a tipping point. I think America's smart. I think the, the taxpayers are smart. They know this administration's pulled. Look, right now they're trying to flip the script, right? It, now the, the border's out of control because Republicans failed to sign this disastrous security bill. They, they, they created a bill. They got a few Republicans to, to agree to it, but they know it never passed the House. Why did they do that? They did it because the House would never pass it. So now they can flip the script and say, well, we offer to secure the border, but uh, the Republicans shut it down. But in their bill, they wanted 35,000 illegal entries a week before they took steps to, to shut the border down. Why not one? Why not 10? Why 35,000, right? How about zero? But I, 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 it, look, I'm a Trump guy. Greatest president in my lifetime. No one did more to secure this nation than that. We want the border secured. Give President Trump back an office. He will secure the border at the highest level this country has ever seen. He'll, he'll, he'll abolish the criminal cartels in Mexico. He'll take them out. Because the country in Mexico is not doing a damn thing about criminal cartels who have killed more Americans than any terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. President Trump would declare him a terrorist organization. He would send a hellfire rocket down there. And he would take the cartels out. Because they need to be taken out because they killed over 100,000 Americans. This administration has held Mexico accountable. They haven't held China accountable for creating all the fentanyl they're selling to the, the criminal cartels. This administration sent back and watched this country get destroyed. We need President Trump back to save this great nation. He's the guy, and we need him back. Well, and, and so, Sarah. Well, and, and so, Sarah. I mean, you, you're talking about you haven't been just to the border. You've been to other places, that have been directly impacted. Do you think that I, I'm not saying that Chicago is going to flip red anytime soon, but do you think that there might be enough uh, of the needle being pushed that people will say, even on just on this issue, that 
the people that we've been voting for for decades don't actually care about us? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I did. I saw that actually in Chicago. You know, just walking throughout Chicago through the neighborhoods, talking to people who have been directly impacted, whose community centers have been taken over uh, as migrant facilities, or in New York City, for example, one I, I visited one of the schools, one of the many schools that was taken over, PS 133. I'll never forget that. And I walked over there, and they took the gymnasium from this elementary school. And they just put single male adults in this elementary. It was like 10 feet away from the elementary school. And the men were going out at night and drinking and smoking and, you know, right by the elementary school. And the neighbors were furious. And these were people who are not predominantly conservative or Republican. These are independents, people who I spoke to who said they were Democrat, who said they were never going to vote Democrat again, that they couldn't. Yeah. You go to other parts of the country, you can go to, you know, Dayton, Ohio, or Franklin, Ohio, where um, I was very close with the coroner there, and sadly, you know, her office, the morgue, was overflowing with bodies of young American children who were dying from overdose deaths and fentanyl to the point where a few years ago they had to put up freezers outside the coroner's office just to keep all the bodies cold while she was processing it. And she was so devastated that, you know, there were tears in her eyes. She couldn't believe what was happening to her community. So absolutely, from California to New York City, people across the country are waking up. But the most important thing is that people have hope. And I think each and every one of us that are here at CPAC needs to spread the word. I know it's been tough. I know 2020 was tough. I know it's been a tough ride for a lot of us. But we've got to get up. we got to speak up. Silence is our enemy's greatest weapon against us right now. We can't be afraid. we got to talk. we got to get to the ballot boxes. We have to vote. And we have to live as we are by principle as Americans because if we give up right now if we walk away right now I'm afraid like I said earlier I mean this is the end this is it it's 2024 we've got to make it happen and I believe we can with President Donald Trump as much as I would like to continue on this unfortunately we are out of time so thank you all so much for uh, attending here today again Julio Rosas mostly peaceful dot live thank you give it up for our panel here all star panel right here to break the law and when we had that memorandum he is essentially telling the people uh, the, the, the sub headline really encapsulates what what kind of what the, the chairman has for it uh, and I kind of liken it to it was like well we have an arsonist that uh, has a contempt uh, but to, to kick things off uh, chairman green uh, you made history. Important to highlight because, uh, unsurprisingly, the mainstream media doesn't view it that way. I wanted to ask you, because that, that, that took a long time, because we talked about that this time last year, and you, you were... We have a cabinet secretary that could actually disregard the Constitution so much, the separation of powers. All the fires that he started, why are the police after him? Uh, so, so, Tom, you went after the fact. I think the thing that surprised me the most, and thanks for, thanks for mentioning it, was... Setting the stage for that. Um, so now that you've gone through the process and... Uh, that's been completed. What? The smoking gun. When we found the memorandum uh, where... Because as we all know, the border uh, is a mess. I wonder why. Uh, we'll get to that in a second.